We'll call the uh, Subcommittee on Communications and Technology uh, to order and begin our hearing on the evolution of wired communications networks. Wired communications networks have come a long way since the days of the telegraph or the rotary phone. It's, going, it's getting harder and harder to remember, remember a time when if you wanted to reach out and touch someone, Ma Bell's pair of twisted copper wires were the only option. Today's consumers have so many more options. Cable, wireless, satellite, and yes, even the telephone companies are all offering Americans the connectivity to communicate with the world. As all of the services consumers have grown to love as standalone networks like voice and video are increasingly just data applications, completion between network providers has never been more vigorous. And over the top providers like Skype, Apple, uh, Apple's FaceTime, Netflix, and Hulu are bringing a new facet to competition for consumers' communications dollars. But while their competitors have gone through successive generations of technological improvements, wired communications networks have languished. This isn't because of a lack of innovation, but rather because of a declining user base. High costs and unique regulatory mandates have conspired to make the economics of upgrade untenable. Today, however, we stand on the cusp of two transitions in the wires network, the IP transition and the upgrade of networks to fiber. Now, these transitions are a natural evolution as technology advances, greater capabilities develop, prices drop, and competition forces the market to respond. While some of the costs of upgrade have changed and wireline providers are increasingly branching out beyond their voice service routes, the outdated regulations once enacted to break up a monopoly remain. Consumers have come to expect, as well as they should, competition among providers and the innovation uh, innovative offerings that result from that competition. The question we face today is this, what is the appropriate role for the Federal Government in this transition? We should be looking not only on the theoretical impact of competition policies on the market as it exists today, but also to the practical impact of the rules in an uncertain future. ILEX, looking to invest in future technology, should be able to do so without the specter of maintaining legacy networks. Those in the competitive community should be able to look to the future with the certainty that they have the opportunity to serve their customers. And consumers should be able to embrace this transition without an interruption in the services they already enjoy. We must strike the appropriate balance between protecting consumers, promoting competition, and not slowing the pace of needed innovation. The Internet and wireless worlds have thrived without heavy regulation. The last thing we want to do is stifle the unprecedented growth and innovation of the Internet by subjecting it to complicated, outdated, government-imposed rules of the plain old telephone networks. It is time to take a hard look at the role of regulation in the modern wired communications network marketplace, and our witnesses are here to help us do just that. I thank the witnesses, I thank the witnesses for their testimony, and now I would yield to uh, my colleague from Texas, Mr. Barton, for one minute. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That is perfect timing. I just walked in. Um, I want to thank you for holding this hearing on the transition of the Internet pro to the Internet Protocol. Uh, it's a topic that we have not discussed, but we need to discuss in this Congress. I was actually serving on this subcommittee and the full committee back in 1996 and participated in many conversations, debates, hearings, and markups regarding that act. I remember discussing how we could make the marketplace more competitive. And that, at that time, AT&T did basically have a monopoly. And we believe that creating the incumbent local exchange, the ILEX, and then the competitive local exchange was a good solution to spur competition. That marketplace then and the marketplace today, Mr. Chairman, as you know, uh, are not the same. I do question now whether we need the Title II pr protections of the CLEX that we put in place back in 1996, and I think this hearing is a good start to answering that question. Thank you. And I now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, for 42 seconds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for holding this hearing today, and I appreciate our witnesses for being here today. Within the last three decades, we have entered a digital age of communications and witnessed the emergence of multimodal competition in a dynamic Internet ecosystem that is replacing the public switch telephone network and time division multiplex technologies with Internet protocol-based platforms. As we continue to see the convergence and evolution of our telecommunications marketplace, the future of regulation is a topic that must be addressed so that it does not thwart future investment 
innovation or economic growth. We need to ensure that current laws and regulations reflect the technologies and, com and competitive dynamics of today's marketplace while protecting consumers' ability to access the communication services of their choice and safeguarding the reliability and security of those services. I'd also ask to submit this uh, chart, Mr. Chairman, for the record showing the declining share of U.S. households with the ILX switch landline service as their primary uh, line service over the last 10 years. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, and I yield back. And uh, without objection, the uh, chart you reference will be submitted for the record. I will now turn to my friend and colleague from California, Ms. Eshu, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to all of the witnesses and uh, packed hearing room. Uh, Seventeen years ago, the uh, 1996 Act uh, stated uh, its intention, quote, to promote competition and encourage the rapid development or deployment of new telecommunication uh, technologies. In the years that have uh, followed, uh, hundreds of new entrants have emerged, and with their creativity and ingenuity, billions of dollars have been invested and thousands of new jobs have been created. So uh, there have been uh, a lot of good things that have come from that. As the title of today's hearing suggests, an evolution, and I underscore the word, an evolution in wired communication networks is underway, creating new ways of delivering a familiar service, a phone call. For over a decade, communications companies have been making the transition to IP. And so I think it's incumbent upon uh, all of us here uh, to decide uh, why we would remove rules that have helped pave the way for greater competition and innovation in the marketplace. And it's a worthy examination. Changes in technology and infrastructure do not alter the national goals that have always guided our communication policies. As Commissioner Rosenworcel and Public Knowledge have both articulated, our conversation should begin by laying out the core values or principles that will guide the transition to all IP voice networks. Fundamentally, the FCC uh, must ensure universal service to all Americans. Uh, and uh, the rules of the road for competition, as well as strong consumer protections and access to 911. Consumers and businesses have to have confidence in the reliability and the functionality of these services particularly during times of emergency. And I'm sure it's an area that we're going to hear about and concentrate on today. The reality is, is that consumers don't consider whether a phone call is delivered through a traditional switched network or via IP. They just expect their phone call to connect as it always has. We all support investment that enables companies to offer their consumers new and innovative services and do so more efficiently and re uh, reliably. But changes in technology don't automatically, don't automatically make markets more competitive. I look forward to our witnesses' perspectives uh, on how we can ensure that the IP transition results in more competitive choices. And finally, it's important that the investment in job creation uh, to remember that the investment in job creation do not come from just two or three companies, but rather an ecosystem, and we're blessed to have that in our country, that includes hundreds of communications companies, both small, medium, and large. Earlier this year, a study found that updated pro-competition policies would stimulate the hiring of up to 650,000 new employees in the telecom sector over the next five years and $184 billion of private funds into U.S. telecommunications networks. So, Mr. Chairman, the topic of today's hearing raises, um, first of all, it's an important topic. It also raises important questions uh, that uh, it's our responsibility to have thoroughly answered. As the migration to all IP networks continues, the testimony of our witnesses, and we have a sterling uh, panel here today, will help ensure that our laws and regulations promote new investment, competition, and consumer choice. And I'd like to ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, that this letter from the Competitive Carriers Association reiterating the importance of longstanding tech neutral uh, interconnection requirements be submitted for the record. Without objection. Thank you. And I yield back. General Lee yields back the balance of her time. Chair now recognizes the Vice Chair of the full committee, the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for holding this hearing. It is important, it is timely, and we want to welcome our witnesses, and thank you for being here. As you've heard each of us talk about uh, competition and looking at how that has changed in the communications marketplace, and today we have that intermodal competition among the ILEX, the CLEX, VOIP, uh, cable, satellite, others, uh, but these competitive services are subject to different rules based on outdated assumptions. And I think that it's not easy for regulators in the federal government and here in D.C. to change how they think about the treatment toward communications in today's marketplace. And I, I do feel that it is our responsibility to look at how we create the appropriate environment put some regulatory certainty in place, and then encourage that private capital and investment and focus on creating jobs. There are three things that I want to drill down on a little bit today with you all. Uh, number one, is it fair to tell someone who wants to invest in tomorrow's technology that they need to slow down in order to maintain an old network that they don't want to invest in anymore? Number two, does it still make sense for the old rotary dial regulatory model, and yes, some of us do remember that model, to hold back the communications revolution that is before us now. And number three, how can we make the transition to the internet protocol as seamless and dependable as possible? Those are questions worthy of discussion. I thank you all for your time, and at this time I will yield to any other member. I do not have anyone in the queue. Does anyone else back. on uh, the Republican side want to make any comments? If not, the uh, gentleman lady yields back. Now recognize uh, the, my friend, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Since the days of the black rotary phone, Americans have been able to count on the phone network to call friends and family, conduct business, and reach emergency services when needed. Today, thanks to innovation and competition, Consumers can, can connect to the phone network in more ways than ever before. But when we pick up a wireless smartphone or dial a number over voice over internet protocol service, few of us pause to consider the technology involved. We simply expect our phone calls to go through. The ongoing transition from traditional circuit switched networks to internet protocol or IP Based networks is the technical backdrop of, for today's hearing. But our phone network is more than a system of wires, switches, and technical protocols. It's an essential part of the social and economic fabric of the United States. As we consider this next network evolution, we must continue to protect the core values that have guided our communications policy for nearly a century. Many of today's witnesses have articulated some version of these values, and there's widespread agreement on these principles. Our commitment to universal service is a recognition that all of us benefit when everyone is connected. We protect competition because it is the most efficient way to generate new products and lower prices with the added benefits of limiting regulation. We have rules for consumer protection because the marketplace needs oversight to ensure that services like 911 are provided even if the market is not yet demanding them. This is the mandate Congress has entrusted to the FCC, and it does not change with new generation of technology. I think we all recognize the transition to IP-based networks is already happening, and this is a good thing. The transition means more investment and opportunities for economic growth and new services that can improve everything from health care delivery to energy efficiency. The challenge we face is how to manage this transition in a way that does not disrupt businesses and consumers that rely on traditional services today. I uh, agree uh, with Mr. Ciccone that we need the FCC as an expert agency to help guide the evolution to an all IP network.
but I caution against using the advent of IP-based services as a vehicle to try to undermine the FC's, FCC's authority to preserve competition and protect the public. Whether addressing complaints about rural call comp completion or ensuring network reli reliability during disasters, we need the FCC to address the impacts of the IP transition. A vibrant and vital FCC is critical to ensuring that the transition ultimately achieves the goal we all share, which is a world-class network that delivers greater benefits for consumers and our economy. And I thank Chairman Walden for holding this important hearing and working with us to assemble a balanced panel. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to, to enter into the record a paper by Professor Kevin Werbach titled, No Dial Tone, The End of the Public Switched Telephone Network. Without objection. And Mr. Chairman, I wish to, at this time to yield the uh, balance of my time to the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have the privilege of introducing John Burke, a Vermonter from Castleton, Vermont, graduate of Dartmouth College and 12-year uh, member of the Public uh, Service Board, which is our Public Utility Commission. And uh, John uh, has served on the Committee on Telecommunications with the National uh, Association of Rural Utility Commissioners. And uh, one of the things that he's so good at is talking about the impact on rural areas of telecom policy. And Congressman Latta and I, as you know, started a rural caucus to try to take a specific look at how the policies that we have to implement are going to be affecting rural areas. And there's no person with more experience and uh, wiser counsel than the person that we're going to hear from, John Burke, from the great town of Castleton, Vermont. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time, and the gentleman from California yields back the balance of his time. And so now we're ready to move forward with our distinguished panel of witnesses. We thank you all for your testimony. It's uh, most enlightening, even if there's a little conflict here and there among you, which is why you're all here. So with that, we'll uh, start off with Jim Ciccone, who is the Senior Executive Vice President for External and Legislative Affairs for AT&T. Mr. Ciccone, thank you for being with us, and we look forward to hearing your comments. And we're still on an old wired copper network, so if you could turn on that microphone. <laughs> Boy, that's embarrassing. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Chairman Walden, uh, uh, Ranking Member Issue, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thanks for the opportunity to testify with you today, and thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, four years ago, uh, as you know, the FCC issued the National Broadband Plan as directed by you. Uh, that plan concluded that bringing modern broadband services to all Americans is vital and that to do so we must have communications policies rooted in the future, not the past. In my testimony today, I want to focus on four key points concerning this very important IP transformation. First, the transition to all IP networks is happening today, and I think the, the chart uh, that you have up here demonstrates that. That's over a 10-year period. And the, uh, uh, and the smallest part of that at the end of that is is uh, Is that uh, hard legacy. for you to see or for us to see? Uh, Maybe well, they could. <laughs> oh, all right. I had, I had hoped the committee would have it, but. Um, We've got it covered. Uh, Go and this is based on government data, but uh, it shows that by the end of this year, uh, only about 25 uh, percent of Americans will actually um, be taking advantage of the legacy wireline services, three quarters of Americans would have moved to alternatives. Uh, uh, the National Broadband Plan, uh, I think, recognizes that this IP transition is well underway. It is happening today. Uh, and I posit that all my fellow panelists recognize this as well. The communications marketplace has changed dramatically, and so has my company in response to that. Today we provide broadband and communication services in robustly competitive markets where consumers have an almost overwhelming array of choices. And believe me, they exercise those choices on a daily basis. Today, consumers and businesses are abandoning the old circuit-switched wireline network in droves and are moving to IP and mobile services offered by a host of different providers. In fact, it is estimated that what we lovingly call POTS, which is plain old telephone service, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and the chart demonstrates, uh, uh, would be confined to only 25 percent of U.S. households. Uh, in fact, in Florida and Michigan, two states that are in our wireline footprint, only about 15 percent of homes are still connected to the legacy wireline network today. 
Second point, this transition to an all IP network is a good thing and it should be embraced. This is a huge and crucial undertaking for our country. We are replacing the networks that served us well for 100 years with far more advanced and capable networks, networks we hope will serve us well for the next 100 years. The National Broadband Plan correctly concluded that these new smart networks are vital to our nation's economic development and to maintaining our global competitiveness. But these networks don't happen by themselves. They have to be built, and to build them, companies need the right incentives to invest. Most important, companies must be able to retire old infrastructure in order to make the investments in new infrastructure, just like any other business would do. To do otherwise makes little sense and would impede what the National Broadband Plan rightly has made a national imperative. Third point, we have the time to do this right. This is not a flash cut. The transition to all IP networks will take place over the course of this decade, but we have to use that time wisely. The FCC's Technical Advisory Committee suggested that the old legacy networks be retired by 2018 and that the FCC should in any event set a date certain for their retirement. My company believes it will actually take us until 2020 to accomplish that, and even then it will require a maximum effort on our part. In the meantime, we have asked the FCC to conduct industry-wide trials. In our case, we suggested converting two pilot wire centers out of some 4,700 wire centers in our footprint to all IP. We feel trials are critical. As careful as our planning is, no one can anticipate every issue that may arise when we actually transition off the legacy wireline infrastructure. Trials will help us learn while we still have a safety net in place. And as we learn, all of us, industry, government, customers and stakeholders, can then work together over the coming years to address any problems we find. This leads to my final point, which is the importance of an overall framework of values and principles to guide us during this transition to all IP networks. In that regard, some of our friends in the public interest community, including one of my colleagues on the panel here today, have, I, have I think, served us very well. They have stressed that this transition from the old to the new should consider things we have all come to see as fundamental, universal connectivity consumer protection, reliability, public safety, interconnection. We know that an all IP world will not be a regulatory free zone, nor are we seeking that. But we do feel that any regulation should be rooted in the problems of today, not the problems of a bygone era. Regulations should also recognize and give deference to the choices of consumers in what are now highly competitive markets and treat all providers equally regardless of technology or their company's lineage. This is not the first time the U.S. has helped plan for a communications transition. As noted by the National Broadband Plan, we will need wise government policies to ensure that legacy regulations do not impede the investments our country needs and that the interests of consumers are protected as these new technologies are deployed. Thank you again for holding this hearing today, and I will look forward to your questions. Mr. Zaccone, thank you for your testimony. We appreciate your participation in the hearing. We will now go to Mark Iannuzzi, who is President of Telnet Worldwide. We are thankful that you are here today to represent the industry and yourself. And please uh, turn on that microphone, pull it up close, and we will look forward to your comments as well, sir. Thank you for joining us. Chairman Walden, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Eshoo. Ranking Member Waxman, and to each of the members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. I am Mark Iannuzzi. I am President and Founder of Telnet Worldwide. We are a competitive facilities-based carrier uh, providing telecommunications and broadband services. We are headquartered in Troy, Michigan. We are also very privileged and proud to be the communication service provider to Chairman Opton's uh, district offices in Kalamazoo and St. Joseph Benton Harbor, Michigan. Telnet offers a complete range of essential communication services for small to middle-sized businesses, including classic voice, IP telephony, hosted IP applications, and advanced data and networking services. In this increasingly connected world, we help unify and simplify all the ways that businesses communicate and collaborate, providing them big business solutions to small businesses at prices that they can afford. Today, I'm pleased to uh, appear on behalf of Comtel. <clears throat> it's the Competitive Communications Association. Nearly two-thirds of the Comtel members are small and middle-sized businesses, a majority of which have $10 million or less in revenues and fewer than 100 employees. However, the DNA of these companies is about entrepreneurs serving entrepreneurs. 
A little background about myself. I've been, I was born and raised in Detroit. I'm an American engineer and entrepreneur. I built Telnet with my brothers 15 years ago from the dirt out of the basement of our home. To this day, though, however, since that time, we have invested upward of $100 million, employing now over 100 career associates in our company, and we're also very proud to have created the first network in the state of Michigan which integrates the vast majority of the state with a service area greater than AT&T and Frontier combined. One of the things that's indelible upon me was a conversation I had with my father when I was about five years old when I had to do a book report on, on poverty. Uh, I asked my father, what is poverty? And my father paused and he told me, is, it is a, poverty is about persons without choice. Now, at 10 years old, I didn't quite grasp what that meant because I thought it was all about not having a lot of money. But it was his pride of being an, a, an Italian immigrant, a U.S. citizen, to be a part of this great land of opportunity that he had choice for himself and our family. So with that as a backdrop, I want to make it clear as we have these debates I or the competitive community, we are not against AT&T. We are not against the ILEX. AT&T is a proud American company. We want all companies to do well. It's in our interest. With they, when they raise themselves, they raise the entire industry, and we have the ability to serve customers better. So it's not about what we're against. It's about what we're for. We're for robust competition, for merit over might. For much as things change in this technological age, some things never change. One of which is the enduring truth of free functioning competitive markets to bring about the greatest good for the widest array of people the world has ever seen. We are for the rule of law, which means trust. It means certainty in keeping our collective promises, including those to the capital markets which have invested their, themselves in our endeavors. And finally, we are for ensuring that there are no artificial barriers to progress. Not only for those of us who are currently in the market today, but for all those who are yet to be born who, are, who will take up the mantle that we have set forth. So let us begin from the, be let's start at the beginning, the 1996 Act. The 1996 Act unleashed the greatest advancements in communication history since the history of history improvements to our capabilities today in terms of the, com the capabilities, the competitive position, and the productivity in this country are mind-boggling. And to that extent, I would like to extend my sincere salute to Chairman Upton, to Congressman Dingell, and all the members here who are participatory in that 96 Act, because your, your leadership was instrumental in forging a bipartisan team for this landmark legisla legislation which has revolutionized the industry of communications. At the very soul of that act, the very soul, was designed specifically to open up competition, including the ability for the incumbent dominant companies to expand their service offerings. And they have done very well. They entered the LD market, and ultimately, the baby bells bought my, my bell. Now, there are some here that would say that there are technical limitations in the act. I say to them as I say to you. The act is not and cannot be about technological limitations. It is rather about technology inspiration through a simple framework for free functioning competitive markets to exist. Why this matters? We understand small businesses, I believe. And that's why Telnet came into because this is where we thrive. Small businesses seek to be relevant in what they do, not necessarily experts in technology. Small businesses cannot afford to go out and pay for the consultants to sort out the alphabet soup of technology. Rather, it's often where it's their next door neighbor's nephew's cousin that comes in and tries to help them figure out some of the, uh, the things going on here. The competitive in industry can touch these, these small businesses. We sit across the table, we examine their needs, we establish uh, solutions, tailors to those needs and help them go from crawl, walking to run. 
You know, God blessed them, but this is not the AT&T's forte. forte. Our goal, in fact, our promise to our customer is to be the last service provider that they ever need because we want them for life. We do, to do this, we must ensure that we can future-proof their investments and deliver ongoing value. So let's get to the heart of the matter. There are three things that are, are key to the, what's this conversation here about the next generation networks. The last mile is the essential business building block for functioning competitive markets, regardless of technology. Our network is the best in the world, but it is only good as its weakest link, and that is the last mile. It is that secondly, it is important that these networks are interconnected, that we can exchange traffic at just and reasonable rates and their terms and conditions regardless of technology. And third, we need to make sure that the business agreements and pricing between the dominant and competitive pair are negotiated and adjudicated with, with the firewall backstop of our local public utility commissions. Mr. Iannuzzi, I'm going to have to have you wrap up. You're about two and a half minutes over. Thank so. you. In conclusion, um, I came into this business 15 years ago with the dri driving desire to make things better, to make things less expensive through business process improvement and technology adva advancement. If I ever had any doubt that, that there was going to be a technological limitation in a tech business, that would have been a non-starter. The telmets may come, of the world may come and go, but what which never, must never perish from this great nation is that we do not erect barriers which impoverish, but we stay true to our competitive spirit as Americans for those ingredients which promote prosperity and well-being for all. <coughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Hi, Nuzi. Thank you for your comments, and uh, we appreciate your testimony. We'll go now to uh, Harold Feld, who's the Senior Vice President of Public Knowledge. We welcome you back before our subcommittee, and we look forward to your summary of, of your testimony as well. Mr. Feld, go ahead. Thank you. Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, um, thank you for inviting me to testify today. Uh, the transition of our wireline networks to Internet protocol-based services is a tremendous opportunity for our nation but we must make sure the transition results in an actual upgrade in technology without a downgrade in the services upon which Americans depend. For decades, our country has used the reasonable rules based on fundamental principles to build a phone network that became the envy of the world. We are the country that brought a phone to every farm, the country that built a network you can count on. We accomplished this by moving certain fundamental values with us as our networks evolved, as we now face the opportunities and challenges of implementing the next generation of communications technology, we must continue to leave no one behind. Americans are so used to relying on the protections of the phone network, they often don't even notice them. We conduct our business and personal communications as if we can always trust the phone network will just work, because it has. During emergencies, we can always call for help from police, firefighters, and hospitals. When someone calls a friend on another phone network, that call will always go through, regardless of which carriers they subscribe to or where they live. In the rare instance that any part of the system breaks down, government authorities at the local, state, and federal levels move swiftly to act as if our lives depended on it, because they do. Every one of these benefits is the result of deliberate policy choices that serve specific basic values. Our phone network became the envy of the world because our policymakers valued what public knowledge calls the five fundamental principles. One, service to all Americans. Two, competition and interconnection. Three, consumer protection. Four, network reliability. And five, public safety. There are some who believe the IP transition should be a glide path to eliminate FCC oversight. But as carriers begin the transition, we have concrete examples that many of the essential services we take for granted are at risk in rural and not so rural areas, for individuals, and for small businesses. One of the worst problems is the continuing inability of rural residents to receive telephone calls reliably. As carriers switch to IP technology, they can route calls through least cost router systems, creating latency and sometimes trapping calls in perpetual loops in a world where we simply allow the marketplace to work, this doesn't get fixed. As one carrier told the complaining subscriber, due to living in a rural area, you will experience service issues. The FCC will address this at the open meeting next Monday, but in a world where the FCC could only regulate based on market power or in response to unfair or deceptive practices, as some have urged, rural America would be out of luck. Which brings me to my larger point. 
IP technology brings the potential for new services, but it also brings the potential for new ways to crash the system. IP doesn't work with a lot of legacy equipment or services. It brings in all of the cybersecurity issues, like malware and cyber attacks, without any of the existing defenses. I am not alone in worrying that things could go very wrong. The Department of Defense and the Federal Aviation Administration have both filed with the FCC to express concern that the IP transition, if not handled properly, could interfere with vital government operations. As with rule call completion, we may find we actually need the FCC to use its legacy authority to solve these problems. Rather than thinking of the FCC as an obstacle that stands in the way, we should think of it as our last defense against a total train wreck. Because at the end of the day, the measure of success for the transition will not be how many regulations did you kill, but does the phone network still work for everyone? For all these reasons, I'm very glad to hear Jim Coney acknowledge the importance of doing this right, of avoiding any kind of flash cut that could cause major disruption and for acknowledging this will not be a regulatory free zone. To everyone's surprise, public knowledge and AT&T agree on a lot because we want the same thing, a competitive modern network for all Americans. Unfortunately, we still debate this as if we were for or against upgrading our phone system or even for or against AT&T. This is absurd. We want AT&T and every other carrier to invest in its network. No one is seriously suggesting that AT&T or any other carrier should preserve copper to the end of time. While we will fiercely disagree on how to make this work, we all want to make this work and we know that the stakes are high. Most importantly, we need to stop thinking of this as AT&T's transition, where AT&T proposes something and everyone else reacts. We need to plan out a transition that reflects our values. This is the transition of the phone system of the United States of America on which 300 million people depend every single day. We need to recognize we all have a shared benefit from making this network reach everyone and therefore a shared responsibility to make it work for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Feld. Maybe we could create a government website they could all work through and <laughs> never mind. Uh, we're just kidding. That'll be late. We all learn from our mistakes. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> We go now to uh, Mr. John Burke, who's back before our subcommittee. We appreciate uh, your participation. Uh, he's board member and public service board of the state of Vermont. Mr. Burke, we're delighted to have you here again, and uh, thanks for your testimony, and please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Ranking Member Eshoo and members of the subcommittee, thank you for allowing me to testify on the topic of IP transition. In recent months, under Acting Chairwoman Clyburn, the FCC has greatly increased its interaction with the states. We are particularly pleased with the outreach from the internal FCC task force to NARUC's own federalism task force. Chairman Clyburn is to be applauded for her leadership and for her outreach. In my home state of Vermont, we face many challenges. Very little fiber is being deployed to the home, and there are many areas without broadband access. There is limited competition even in urban areas. Wireless coverage leaves much to be desired, even where it exists, and yet, even in Vermont, transition to the IP-based voice network is occurring. In this latest evolution, which has been underway for quite a few years now, networks are migrating away from circuit-switched voice and data services to IP-based services. During the transition, like the previous ones, it is crucial for policymakers to focus on the right issues. No regulator or legislator should intervene in the market to put a thumb on the scale in favor of one technology over another. The market should make those choices. The reason public service commissions and agencies like the FCC were created and regulate remains the same. First, we regulate where competition is not vigorous enough to adequately protect consumers. Secondly, we intervene to impose public interest obligations. Regardless of the level of competition, some oversight will always be necessary to provide what the market will not, including consumer protection, local number portability, interconnection, prioritization of service restoration, 9-11 service, disabled access, and universal service. The AT&T request for the Wire Center trials raises some questions of why trials are needed now. The AT&T, AT&T and other providers have no significant problems rolling out IP-based service to date. The transition is well underway, and major reason why issues remain is because the FCC has focused on the wrong issues. 
The transition is not about regulation or deregulation. The FCC has ample tools in the 96 Act to eliminate unneeded regulation. Nor should the debate be technology focused. Congress established a technology neutral framework in the 96 Act and incorporated the core values of consumer protection, universal service and competition. The FCC should just follow this framework. But for over 10 years, the agency has followed uh, what Congress has set out, but not in exact terms. Instead, the agency has been unable, under both Democratic and Republican chairmen, to provide needed certainty by classifying VoIP services either as a telecommunications service or as an information service, which has undermined the communications market. Leaving this question unresolved has created the regulatory arbitrage that undermined intercarrier compensation system and is at the reason at the very base for the call completion problems that Mr. Feld mentioned. It has also left some consumers who chose IP-based services with fewer protections than they might have had with the circuit switch service, despite uh, voice services being exactly the same from a consumer's point of view. The states and industry stakeholders continue to waste significant resources and ultimate expense of taxpayers and ratepayers on proceedings that would be unnecessary if the FCC acted. The FCC blessed real-world VoIP interconnection trials will not necessarily help the Commission clarify the statutory basis for the incumbent LEC's duty to provide VoIP interconnection. The clarification begins and ends with an interpretation of the states of the statute. There is no question that the interconnection is technically feasible. AT&T and Verizon manage that on a daily basis on their own networks. Rather than <coughs> inventing new legal theories with no statutory support, specifically to avoid classifying VoIP telephony, as the FCC did in the November 2011 transformation order, the agency should just classify the service. Oversight of VoIP services has absolutely nothing to do with either the Internet or peering arrangements. Verizon and AT&T assure their customers that their VoIP services are not Internet services on their websites daily. If the FCC continues along, uh, along to consider technology trials, Congress should encourage the agency to first seek the benefit of a fact-based recommendation from an adequately funded federal, state, USF joint board. Any proposed trials can only benefit from the significant state involvement. In conclusion, while technologies change, the expectations of our consumers do not. Consumers expect the same level of service and protections they have been accustomed to, and it is up to us all to ensure that those expectations continue to be met. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Burke. We appreciate your, uh, your counsel today. We will go now to our final witness on this panel, uh, Mr. Randolph May, who is President and Founder of Free State Foundation. Mr. May, it is good to have you back, and we look forward to your comments as well. Chair <coughs> Chairman Walding. Ranking Member Eshoo and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify. I am president of the Free State Foundation, a nonpartisan, free market oriented think tank that focuses its work primarily in the communications policy area. <clears throat> I have been involved for 35 years in communications policy in various capacities, including having served as Associate General Counsel at the FCC. I appreciated the opportunity to testify in July before this committee regarding FCC process reform. That hearing was very important, but frankly, the topic at this hearing may be even more important. As the transition away from narrowband communication services to digital broadband services continues, the fundamental question confronting policymakers is this. Will the existing public utility style framework that still largely governs communication service providers be replaced by a free market oriented paradigm that accelerates the ongoing broadband digital transition? Or instead, will the regulatory framework be an impediment to progress? The answer has important implications for the nation's economic and social well being because there is widespread agreement that the transition to IP services, which indisputably is leading to dramatic marketplace changes, will be completed at some point. 
and there's also widespread agreement that completion of the transition is a positive good because IP-based services provide consumers with more functionalities in less costly ways than do copper-based TDM services. There's no doubt that the digital revolution has enabled increasing competition among broadband providers for the provision of voice, high-speed data, and video services. Whether these providers offer their services over wireline, cable, wireless, satellite, fiber, or whatever technology. The relevant point is not that all of the services offered by all of the competitors are perfectly substitutable or that they meet every consumer's desire at all times. The relevant point for policymakers is that for an increasingly large number of consumers, these various competitors provide a choice of service providers, offering a choice of attractive service options. Note that I said above the IP transition almost certainly will be completed at some point in time. But the FCC's actions, and possibly Congress's too, will affect the timing of the transition's completion and whether the regulatory regime that emerges is a proper one going forward. My testimony explains why, in order to benefit consumers and in order to promote investment in new networks and innovation, the legacy regulatory framework, which is based on assumptions of a monopolistic marketplace that no longer exists, should be replaced in a timely fashion by a free market-oriented model. Requiring telecom companies to continue to maintain their TDM networks past when they are economically viable drains investment dollars from deployment for new IP networks. And economists agree that burdening any service provider, regardless of the platform used with unnecessary costly re regulation, does deter investment and innovation. So in the IP world, the FCC's regulatory intervention should be tied closely to findings of market failure and consumer harm. The FCC may well possess the authority under the Communications Act to implement most of the regulatory changes necessary to facilitate completion of the digital transition, while at the same time safeguarding certain basic public safety and universal service interests, which I recognize are important interests to be safeguarded. But to the extent such authority either is lacking or the FCC fails to properly exercise such authority in a timely fashion, then Congress should be ready to step in. For example, Congressman Lattice recently introduced Bill H.R. 2649, which requires the FCC to presume forbearance relief should be granted absent clear and convincing evidence to the contrary, would be a useful tool in enabling the agency to act more quick quickly, especially if forbearance relief is made available for all entities subject to the Commission's jurisdiction, as I think it should be. In any event, aside from any near-term legislation that may be desirable to ensure the benefits resulting from the digital revolution are fully realized, ultimately Congress should adopt a comprehensive overhaul of the current Communications Act along the lines of the Digital Age Communications Act model that I have long advocated and which I describe in my testimony. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I mentioned I served as Associate General Counsel uh, at the FCC. That was in the late 1970s uh, and early 80s under the Carter administration. At that time, traditional economic regulation of the various transportation markets was largely eliminated. And this deregulation, initiated by President Carter's administration, was accomplished on a mostly bipartisan basis. And the Congress and the agencies cooperated productively. The agencies generally initiated deregulatory changes through the administrative process, while Congress engaged in oversight. And Congress eventually legislated to put in place deregulatory regimes that relied for the most part on marketplace competition rather than regulation to protect consumers. 
i believe that a similar opportunity for positive change now exists again thank you for inviting me to testify today and i will be pleased to answer your questions mister may thank you and thanks for your in depth testimony uh, which we all have um, i'm going to start off with uh, questions and i <clears throat> mister Iannuzzi, uh, in your testimony, you said, and I quote the prepared testimony, as incumbents replace their legacy TDM-based technology with IP technology, competitive carriers will lose access to the last mile connections that have enabled them to push deployment of innovative business broadband services to <laughs> American businesses. That is kind of the crux of the argument you represent today, correct? That if they abandon, if, if uh, AT&T or other companies abandon their copper networks, then you are not going to have the ability to get to that last mile, correct? Correct. Now, Mr. Zaccone, from your perspective, um, what does that mean in terms of w is that accurate? Will, you, will at and and other companies still make last mile connection available? And then I'd, I want to go to Mr. May on this as well. And again, hit that microphone button if you would, yeah. Short answer is, of course, we would make them available. And, uh, um, and, and there is nothing we propose that would take that away. Under the same interconnection reasonable rates, terms and conditions? Well, it, it, I think if we are talking about copper loops, mm -hmm. you know, there is nothing in our proposal that would, that would change the treatment of that as a uni. But in terms of an advanced network? Uh, I, I, I think when you are talking fiber. about uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Ethernet, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the FCC has concluded the Ethernet is a competitive service. So I think if we are rolling out uh, uh, Ethernet services and replacement for TDM facilities. That, you know, and, to, and to give you a sense of that, a TDM facility is not classed as a broadband level facility by the FCC currently. So for placing TDM with, with uh, a, a broadband facility, for example, in, in backhaul to a cell tower, um, you know, I, I think the FCC has concluded Ethernet is in fact very competitive. And, and I think, for, you know, uh, in, in fact, I think Sprint's CTO just uh, stated recently that uh, for the same price he pays for a, a T1 to a cell tower, uh, he can get 20 times the capacity by running Ethernet to the same cell tower. And so, uh, uh, so, so obviously if it is a competitive market, we would not uh, we wouldn't feel that, that regulation per se is needed uh, in that area in order to provide an alternative capacity. All right, Mr. Burke, what is your reaction to all of that? Well, I think that one of the things you look at when you look at uh, the potential for interconnection is that um, uh, there are supposed to be agreements. The idea is that they are supposed to agree. That doesn't necessarily mean that all the uh, uh, players have an equal bargaining power. It doesn't always work that way. If that is the case, it may well be necessary for somebody to take a look at those agreements and the, and the 96 Act clearly said, and, and wisely so in my estimation, uh, the states can look at that and arbitrate that. And um, uh, it also defined uh, the service include, to include uh, advanced services. So 96 actually had, in my estimation, had it right and gave a methodology so that uh, uh, you would be able to handle uh, arbitration of these issues if, in fact, um, uh, uh, Mr. Sacconi and Mark couldn't agree. And uh, I think that is uh, another point. Uh, that uh, uh, exists in, in uh, the state's position here and what they would have to do in this, in this brave new world moving forward. All right. Mr. May, from your perspective. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think part of the premise w of your question was uh, based on the continuation of uh, offering of copper-based loops for Mr. Anuzi. And I well, and, and just the ability, regardless of the underlying infrastructure, to have a competitive marketplace right. with these alternative competitors. Right. The, uh, you know, there is a transition going on, which is why right. you called the hearing uh, commendably. Exactly. And, and, you know, from my perspective, uh, over time, as I s said in my oral testimony, it is important that we not require the maintenance by regulatory fiat of, of older technologies okay. that are less efficient and more costly. Uh, so eventually, uh, I'm not in favor of requiring AT&T or anyone else uh, to maintain in existence a technology in a competitive environment that we're, we're moving to that's not efficient. But I want to say one, one other thing, if I could. There's, in Mr. Anuzi's testimony, there's, he, he, he's, he's talking both about the ability to access uh, facilities of, of others and to use those right. last mile facilities. And he's also talking about interconnection. 
of facilities and as we talk about this today those are really they're, they're actually two different things mm -hmm. that, that and, and 251 and 252 without getting too technical they they involve both of those things and from my perspective in terms of where public policy wants to go uh, I'm much I'm, I'm more receptive to arguments that that have some regulatory backstop for interconnection saying you know I can enter I have to interconnect my network with mr. Burke's network or mr. Ciccone's then I am about regulation which continues to require that if I build a facility that I have mm -hmm. to provide access under regulated terms and prices uh, you know ad infinitum for someone else to use those facilities and, and, and the simple reason and this is important I think to understand is when you when you require that type of sharing of facilities and access that he talks about uh, and he, he, he does say he has some facilities of his own, but I, I don't right. know. When you do that, uh, it, it discourages uh, either him from building his own facilities or it, it discourages me if I'm the one that has to provide access from actually investing more okay. to build more facilities. All right. My time has expired, and I now turn to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses. Um, we'll start over here uh, with the Italian part of the table, <laughs> 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 who don't agree with each other, <laughs> despite their that, shared they? background um, ethnically. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Ciccone, you, you stated in your testimony that uh, modern uh, IP networks are both more dynamic and cost efficient than the TDM based um, voice telephone networks that we've depended on um, over the last um, century. Um, how does a new network a technology change the state of competition? Uh, because I think that that really goes to the heart of a lot of what we're talking about here and uh, some of the testimony that we've heard from others. Sh in your view, shouldn't the, uh, uh, the, uh, the rules uh, to preserve and promote competition be technology neutral? I mean, I've always favored technology being neutral in whatever legislation we do. I mean, it's always been um, something that uh, I thought was like a hot stove. Don't go and touch it. I mean, it should be neutral. Well, well first of all, I, I, I don't think the Telecom Act itself makes the, the rules technology neutral. It, it puts most of those rules in Title II, which is entitled common carriage, and it doesn't apply to our wireless service. In fact, you have an express provision in Title III that it can't be applied to wireless service. Uh, it doesn't apply to cable. It applies uniquely to the wireline uh, TDM services provided by a legacy wireline carrier. So, so they're not technology neutral. Uh, uh, in that sense, uh, they're they're uniquely imposed uh, on this uh, on this part of the business, and and as you saw from the chart earlier, it's a declining part of the business at the mm -hmm. current time. Uh, AT and T has fewer than 14 million um, uh, tr uh, uh, customers using traditional wireline services, and by contrast, the number four wireless carrier has double that. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, I'd argue that today. These services are competitive, uh, Congresswoman, and, and, that, uh, and that you all, when you, when you wrote the Act, or rewrote the Act in 1996, I think did something fairly unique. I think you recognized in there that there were major, major transformations that were underway uh, and, uh, and uh, that, were, that, that I, I think augured well for competition, mm -hmm. and you gave the FCC some fairly unique powers there so that are, are not really given to other agencies. So are you agreeing or agreeing that the rules going forward? should promote competition, and, I, but you don't agree they I, should be technology I, I, neutral. I, I certainly, I, I certainly would, would argue that it's an appropriate uh, mission for the FCC to continue doing, but I, I okay. would disagree I that, uh -huh. that all the rules that were needed in 1994 We're not in my office. I've got to get to Mr. Anuzi. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Anuzi, without a regular, you gave great testimony. I love what you said. And, uh, um, it's uncommon for people to come here and speak about, um, um, you know, what the, their father said, how that remained with you, what you do, what you're for. It's not what you're against, but where you want to go and why. 
and um, I just think you gave terrific testimony. Uh, without a regulatory backstop, what incentive do you think that the largest uh, incumbent providers have to reach a, a commercial uh, interconnection agreement with you? Thank you very much, Congresswoman, for your kind remarks. I turn the microphone on so everybody can hear you say, right there. thank you for your kind words, Congresswoman. Thank you. <laughs> 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 no, you don't hear that, right, no. Uh, the, um, when I got my CLEC license, they asked me three questions. One was, do you have the technical acumen? Do you have the financial wherewithal? And do you have the, the business know-how? I would have flunked that test if I was going to go into a business uh, to compete against a 800-pound gorilla without some type of firewall, some type of framework that allowed a competitive marketplace to exist. Because our ability to go and negotiate a commercial agreement, the incentives, that can, just the economics 101 concepts here, the economic incentives of the incumbent provider, they control the connectivity to the customer. It is in their interest not to provide connectivity to other people because they would like to keep that customer. So without that firewall there to make sure that we did have fair and equitable access to the, to the, to the customer, um, there would, the business case would fall. It would just not be there. Thank you very much. I think I'm out of time. Thank you. Generally, uh, I'll submit my, the rest of my questions for the record. I do have them for Mr. Feld and other witnesses. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Mr. Barton uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, last weekend, I finally got to go home to Texas um, after the government shut down. And I hadn't been there. It's the first time in the 29 years I've been in the Congress that I had not, I had spent two consecutive weekends in Washington, D.C. So obviously, I was glad to get home. And when I got home, I walked in to my house and uh, decided to make a phone call. And I, I didn't have a dial tone. And uh, the phone was provided by AT&T, uh, legacy carrier. So I got the phone book out, and I went through the protocol on page 9, you know, dial 1-800, and we'll be happy to help you. And um, said, now, if, if the problem is on your phone in the house, it's 99 bucks. Uh, if it's not, uh, we'll come out and fix it for free. So anyway, I went through that, and I finally... Uh, you know, self-reported a problem, and I did all the things you're supposed to do, and and they they called back and you know they said we'll be out tomorrow by 8 p.m. Well, the next day by 8 p.m. they weren't out, so I, I I picked up my cell phone, which was provided by Verizon, <laughs> and <laughs> called and hit o o o, and I finally got sweet lady in Houston, Texas, and I said, my phone's not working in my home, and I still haven't got the service man, and she, she agreed with me, and she said, we'll be here tomorrow, and by golly, they were, and they fixed it, boom, and the guy could not have been nicer, could not have been nicer, but the moral of that story is I had to use a wireless provider to get my hardline phone fixed. In 1996, CLACs were supposed to, they were competitive, and we wanted the CLACs to compete with the ILACs, the incumbents. Now, since 1996, my congressional district has changed four times, but we're still operating under rules that we put in place for an old system, and it's, it is time just like our congressional districts change every 10 years, in the case of Texas, we've changed two, year, two times in addition to those 10-year changes. We really need to relook at this. And I love AT&T, and I love Verizon, and I love the, the CLEX and all the independents out there, but what I really love is consumer choice and market efficiency and competition that works. So my question to Mr. Ciccone, who I've known since way back when, even before I was a congressman, I knew Jim, uh, 
would, would the group that you represent guarantee access if we did away with some of the regulatory protections under Title II? First Congressman, I'm sorry for your service problems. Well, it, uh, you know, we've, I, had, we've had rain problems. Right, I, but, but I think you made an important point, and that is there are alternatives out there, and, and, uh, and wireless has become uh, an alternative for wireline phone service, and, and there are many, uh, many competitive carriers offering wireless services. Uh, uh, cable offers uh, uh, phone service today. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure in your area or not, but but there are an array of choices out there, and so I, I, I think that that uh, that consumers have those choices today. Now, is it a legitimate uh, function of government to ensure that everybody's connected and 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 has the ability to communicate? Absolutely. I, I you know we've uh, our company's always uh, stood behind the principle of universal service, and I think that's an important function of the government to ensure that that uh, the choices are there and that they are available to all Americans. Well, to, to, to the average consumer, a consumer doesn't care whether they are serviced by an ILEC or a CLEC. What they want is service. What they want is something that works, that is efficient, that, that, and that is, that is cost competitive. Right. You know, so our job on the committee is not to protect an existing market segment. Our job is to do the very best we can to give our consumers choices, and I want the CLECs to stay in business. I'm not anti-CLEC, but I, I want, if, if what we passed in 1996, it might have worked for 1996, but that world doesn't exist today. So let's figure out what exists today and in the future and go that way. And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the hearing, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We turn now to uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, based on some of the testimony we heard today, one might think that we are evaluating a new network being built across the country, an IP network that runs on fiber lines and wireless airwaves. Others suggest that this is no new network, but that new electronics that have been added to the copper and fiber infrastructure that has been transporting voice and data throughout the country for years. Uh, why are these distinctions important? If what we really care about are basic values like protecting consumers and competition, universal service and public safety, why does it matter what kind of infrastructure communications runs over? Mr. Fell, it is my understanding that Google is currently planning to offer extremely fast Internet access over new fiber networks being deployed in three communities. Although consumers, consumers could sign up for a video service to complement their Internet access service, Google is not offering a voice product. Google has not been shy about stating that it is not offering voice, at least in part due to the complex rules associated with providing telephone service. What do you think of Google's argument? Would a company like Google be saddled with regulations if it decided to add voice to its video and broadband offering? Um, I think that there are a couple of points that need to be uh, very clear. First is that when Google talks about the uh, regulations that they found too burdensome, they are not talking about the 251, 252 uh, kind of regulations that have been the focus of the debate here. They are talking about the things that we all agree ought to stay in the system, like 911, uh, like uh, uh, consumer protection and privacy protections, all of these things that we have said, yeah, that is very important. And I well, think what are they talking about? What, give me examples of what they are concerned about. Well, it is expensive to maintain the 911 system. Um, it is expensive to contribute to the Universal Service Fund uh, system to ensure that all Americans uh, are uh, connected. Now, we believe that it is very important to maintain these things. We believe that it is very important. Uh, you know, Google likes to uh, collect the information of the people who use its services. They aggregate it. They have one level of privacy protection for that. Their business model is based on a couple of different things. Uh, in the phone world, we treat this very differently, uh, and you cannot treat uh, a uh, uh, phone call information the same way that you treat a Facebook status update. That oh. uh, People hold that very closely. And I understand for Google to say, we don't want to get into that business. But if we were to say, well, okay, we want to encourage Google to get into this business, so we want to eliminate these kind of vital consumer protections, 
uh, I think that would be a very grave mistake. Uh, and I so think even if they choose not to offer a telephone service, that doesn't lead you to the conclusion that we ought to eliminate the rules for all telephone services. Oh, not at all. And in fact, I would point out any business looking to enter a market figures out what the trade-off is and what their business model is. Mm -hmm. We have a thing that's very valuable in a network that goes everywhere and uses telephone numbers. And I will point out that when we have companies that are VoIP providers, pure VoIP providers that want to use those telephone numbers, we impose certain obligations uh, on them already. Uh, and businesses make the evaluation of whether the benefits of getting that into that business are worth uh, the expense. That's their decision for themselves. Yes. Now, for the rest of public policy and for everybody else, uh, given the importance and, compl and complexity of transitioning voice services to an all IP network, wouldn't it make sense to have a trial overseen by the FCC to help collect data based on real world experience and challenges? This past May, the FCC issued a public notice seeking comment and trials related to the IP transition. Uh, then Chairman Julius Janikowski stated at the time, quote, trials are a smart approach that the FCC has deployed before. In the public notice, the FCC invited carriers interested in pursuing a geographic trial like AT&T, and they proposed to submit a more detailed, comprehensive plan, including the design of the trial that data that would be collected, the rules that would need to be waived, and the role of the states and the tribes. It seems to me that the FCC is approaching this issue methodically and thoughtfully. So let me ask, uh, in the short time I have left, uh, to anybody in the panel that wants to jump in on this, do you believe that the FCC is moving ahead in a diligent and responsible manner in exploring potential trials on the AP transition? If you don't, what would you do differently? I just would say to, and th that, yes, I think the FCC is behaving exactly appropriately. They've invited further comment. I think that we cannot um, treat conversion of let entire hear, wire center let as me hear if there's anybody else with a, con a contrary position, Mr. Ciccone. I, I don't think I would be, I, I would be directly contrary, but I, I, I think there's a couple fundamental points here. I think, first of all, when the FCC put out its additional questions, uh, I, I think we all recognize that the FCC was going through the leadership change from the, the, the former chairman to, you know, uh, a, a chairman not yet confirmed by the Senate. Uh, and, and I don't think, honestly, uh, Chairman Waxman, they were, they were prepared yet to, to answer the question. But I, 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 I don't think they should be leaving open the question of whether we should have trials. I think when we filed the petition almost a year ago, uh, you know, we asked, uh, we asked them to, to actually set up the trials. This isn't an AT&T project, as somebody said earlier. It involves government, it involves the entire industry, it involves consumers and stakeholders, and it shouldn't be up to AT&T to come up with the plan. We actually proposed industry-wide trials to the FCC that the FCC would actually help put together in a collaborative way, working with everybody. And, and so I think they've at least to this point, punted on that, uh, on that uh, decision. I don't think not having trials is an acceptable answer because I think it, it would, in essence, be the government saying, we're not going to plan for this. And, and uh, when you so do your the point is the trials transition. are not methodical and they're not fully thoughtful. Right. Uh, the FCC actually planned the DTV transition, conducted the trials, mm -hmm. learned from them, and it went fairly smoothly. And, and I think that's what needs to happen here, and that's what I still am very hopeful will happen. Okay, thank you. I, I, my time has expired. It's up to the chairman if you want to let anybody else respond. May I comment, please? Ryan Newsy, real quick. Uh, w with all due respect, the, the concept of the trial, in my opinion, is a boondoggle. Uh, the reason behind it is that we do IP all over the place today in the interior of networks and how we connect with other cooperative parties. We get smart people. We know how to do this stuff right now. We're losing ground in terms, we want to try to make the revolution of IP even more profound, then let's get going with it. Uh, it's, it e are there things that we have to attend to to tweak stuff? Sure. But I in terms of the mechanics of it, it's make it sound like water is hard if you want to make it seem complicated. You could take anything and make it sound mm -hmm. more difficult. It's done today all over the place. All right, we're going to have to move on. We'll go now to Mr. Latta for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thanks uh, very much for holding the hearing today, and thanks uh, to all everyone uh, who's testifying today. Really appreciate it and hearing your testimony. If I could uh, start with Mr. Sacconi, if I may, 
Uh, as the gentleman from Vermont mentioned, uh, he and I have worked on different issues, uh, especially concerning uh, rural call completion. It's big, big for both of us, and I have a very unique district. I go from urban to suburban to very rural. And one of the things that uh, I've met with a lot of my rural telecoms out there is that they've had problems with drop calls. And uh, you know, this is a serious issue for folks out there because, again, if you have family members that are elderly and you're trying to call them and all of a sudden you know, they're not picking up that phone, then your next uh, recourse is you call the local law enforcement or the fire department and say, hey, can you go out and check on uh, a family member? In the same way, it, it really hits small businesses or any businesses out on these areas because, again, I have a lot of businesses that are located way out. And all of a sudden, if all of their calls are getting dropped and somebody can't make that call, they lose business and pretty soon they're out of business. And so as we're looking at uh, what's happening out there, as the network, especially the rural providers, transition to IP, how do you think this will affect the call completions in the future? Well, uh, um Notwithstanding Mr. Barton's earlier service problems, Mr. <laughs> Latta, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not aware that AT&T itself has a rural call completion problem, but, I, but I'm very aware that there is a problem there. The FCC has a proceeding underway right now uh, to try to deal with it and, and, and to deal with it in a way that applies across all technologies and across all providers, and that's the, the way it should be. And I, and I think it's an example of what an appropriate role of government should be. But do you think as we go forward with the IP, that especially if the rural providers, do you think that will help them make sure that they don't have the drop calls in the I, future? I, I, I would be hopeful, but again, I, I, I think that's one of the reasons you have trials, to test these things, make sure they work properly, make sure, make sure the replacement technologies are just as reliable as the others. And I, I, I just in response to what Mr. Iannuzzi said a minute ago, too, we can't go out and convert a wire center today from TDM to IP without permission from the FCC. So while a lot of IP investment is going on, we can't do the fundamental investment. There's 20,000 wire centers in the country that have to be converted to IP, and not a single one of them can be converted without permission from the FCC today. So it's why we need the trials to, 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 to take two of those wire centers, all we've proposed, out of 20,000 nationally, conduct the trials and see if we can, if we can accomplish this without the kind of problems that, that you've experienced in the rural areas and, and ensure, frankly, that the, the, the replacement services and technologies are actually better and don't have those issues. Thank you. Uh, Mr. May, in uh, reviewing your testimony uh, in your section uh, number three, it says, ultimately, Congress needs to replace the current Communications Act with a new Digital Age Communications Act, and you state that because of the extent of the dramatic marketplace changes wrought by the IP transition that has already been described, it seems to me that Congress ultimately needs to comprehensively overhaul the, the Communications Act by adopting a new free market-oriented model that breaks uh, thoroughly with the past. Could you elaborate, uh, elaborate on that, please? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Congressman Latta. Uh, one of the reasons why ultimately Congress should pass a new act, it, it really goes to a lot of uh, the discussion we've had today uh, back and forth uh, talking about technology, whether uh, uh, policies are technology neutral or not and how that relates to competition. I mean, the reality is the current act of, is not technology neutral really at its core. We talk so much those who are in this area talk about the smokestack or stovepipe regime because, uh, in essence, uh, the Act uh, uh, establishes different types of regulation uh, based on different types of technical or functional constructs. And, and, what, and, and, so that's, and that's not the most efficient or most uh, sound way for regulation to go forward. So what should happen? really in the future is, is to, uh, competition is obviously important uh, as uh, Mrs. Eshoo has talked about. We all want competition, but what, what we want to have really is an environment, and, and, and in fact the digital revolution is enabling more competition. That's why we have these, that we have cable and wireless and, and fiber and all of these things are part of the digital revolution. But ultimately, in a new act, what we would like to have, uh, in my view, would be a standard that ties the regulatory activity of the agency 
closely to an analysis of the competitive marketplace. And then only if there's a market failure uh, or consumer harm, and, and those, those are, you know, I recognize that if there's consumer harm, there's a place for regulation. I'm not, like Mr. Zaccone, I'm not advocating uh, no regulation, but we, we need in a new act to tie regulatory activity uh, much more closely to an analysis of the marketplace. And that really gets away from all this discussion about uh, this technology and that technology uh, and that type of thing. But the fact that technology is changing uh, and it enables competition, that is a reason for policy changes. It's not a reason to do nothing. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We turn now to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this morning I read in the newspaper that AT&T recently notified many of its special access customers that it will eliminate certain long-term discount price plans, effectively increasing rates by as much as 24 percent. Uh, competitive carriers argue that they have no alternatives to gain last mile access to business customers and must simply accept the higher prices. And, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to pay, place a uh, copy of that article that appeared in the Wall Street Journal this morning and a copy of the ex parte filing that several companies made to the FCC in regard to those rate hikes. Thank you. Uh, let me ask Mr. Feld and Mr. Iannuzzi, uh, how can AT&T institute up to 24 percent price increases if these markets are competitive? And do you find fault in claims by some that competition today eliminates the need for a regulatory backstop, particularly in light of AT&T's action to effectively raise special access prices? Sure. Only a dominant market player can go and raise prices ad hoc and uh, at to those level of magnitude. Uh, it was quite shocking to see that take place. Where those out network elements are very vital to run the connectivity within our network. Uh, so if there was true ability for, to shop and pick, uh, then they would be foreclosing those sales and those revenue streams. And at and in the business to make profit. I, and to then just raise prices, if the market was working and it's an equal service, you would go pick the next lowest provider, provided they had uh, uh, equivalent uh, capabilities. I, I, I would add that we often have a confusion between the underlying infrastructure and the things that ride on top of the underlying infrastructure. And we look at the number of wireless carriers, the number of um, you know, carriers that offer service through that underlying infrastructure, and looking at just the surface of that, we say, wow, there's a lot of competition. But when you actually get below the surface to the infrastructure on which all of that competition rides, you have still the same kind of network problems, still the same kind of infrastructure uh, monopolies um, that you have to worry about. So I think that what we've seen in special access, uh, and this is not a new problem, this has been going on for many years, uh, is that there was a lot of hope and anticipation when we set up uh, criteria about uh, uh, how we were going to tell whether there was competition. Uh, some of that uh, did not happen, but also the criteria were frankly, too optimistic and did not uh, take into account uh, the difference between people offering retail service or people offering different kinds of, of commercial service and the critical infrastructure that you have to get to in order to reach the customers to offer that service. Thank you. Mr. Ciccone, would you like to respond? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, let uh, be clear, when we are talking about the special access facilities mentioned here, we are not talking about services that are broadband. The FCC has not classed these services as broadband. Uh, I think one of the, one of the reasons, uh, Mr. Doyle, that, that you read the Wall Street Journal article that we are not offering uh, uh, service contracts out five and seven years is because we plan as part of the IP transition, the reason we are here today, to be replacing these old facilities with modern broadband fiber-based facilities, including, including Ethernet. So naturally, we don't want to be offering long-term contracts on a facility if we are going to be replacing it with an alternative facility. There is a proceeding underway on special access currently at the FCC that is designed to gather facts on what alternative facilities are available for other providers like Telnet uh, to use. We think that the, 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 the data the FCC collects from all providers 
including cable, is going to show that there are ample alternative facilities there. And one of the alternatives, by the way, is for a sea lake to build its own facilities. We're, we're right now on, on, on have a project underway, and, and hopefully by the, you know, within two years, we'll have run fiber to a million businesses in, the, in our 22 state footprint. And, and I think any other carrier out there is free to do the same Mr. thing. Mr. Ciccone, I, li listen, I understand that you are transitioning uh, and, and that, that, that it probably makes sense that you are not going to do seven-year contracts. I think the concern is not so much that you are discontinuing the long-term contracts, but that you are raising the rates 20 You are not, you're not passing down the discounts. And, and if this were truly a competitive market, I don't know how you could get away with doing that. Mr. Doyle, I'm going to have, have to go back and check on the rates, but I don't think we've raised prices. I think we've eliminated some rate plans, well, but I'd, I don't think prices have gone up. I'd like to see that. Um, let me just, uh, well, Mr. Chairman, I see my time's expired. I'll, uh, I'll just wait for another time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and at this time the chair would recognize the general lady from Tennessee, the vice chair of the full committee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to go back to Mr. Waxman's question, talking about the, the peering agreements. And um, Mr. May, let me come to you, and then Mr. Feld, I'm, I'm going to want to hear from you. Do you think the FCC should do a pilot? project and test um, some of the IP networks to figure out how to make the transition easier for consumers, for businesses? Um, where are you on a pilot project? Uh, I am uh, in favor of one, but uh, you know, I have to say I probably uh, don't need to be as delicate as Mr. Ciccone may need to be. I, I think that the delay, I think the FCC you know, has been a little slow, I would say, in getting these uh, trials off the ground. So I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to see them move quickly. Uh, and I think they would yield useful uh, information. Uh, the, the, uh, but I don't want to see them used, you know, over a, a long time of watching the FCC. Sometimes I, I know when you start these things like this, uh, they can be used in ways that delay ultimately the, the ultimate decision making, that shouldn't be allowed to happen with these projects. The one you started out by mentioning the the interconnection, I think, between in the IP transition. And, and you know, I just want to say, and I said this in my testimony uh, with regard to IP to IP interconnection, I don't think uh, that, uh, and I'm just assuming we'll have the trial or not, but, but ultimately, I don't think the FCC should uh, uh, presume that it's going to regulate these interconnection agreements uh, in the same way that it did uh, in the uh, TDM world. Uh, it's, it's, you know, likely uh, that there won't be many interconnection problems. That hasn't been the case with pure IP to IP connection. Uh, connection. Thus far, they've been very rare that there have been disputes. They've ultimately been worked out really in a voluntary marketplace way. So my counsel would be for the FCC to uh, just presume that it's not going to intervene, that we watch the situation. If it does turn out uh, that there is a real problem with interconnection, I said in my testimony uh, that there could be a regulatory backstop, but it shouldn't look anything like the current 251, 252 process that, that basically is really resembles more of a public utility style regulatory regime. It should be uh, a dispute resolution process that, that ultimately depends on mediation and, and perhaps ultimately baseball all style arbitration or something like that. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Feld, anything? At first, we support having well-constructed trials. I do think that the FCC has been behaving responsibly, however. What AT&T has put in so far is much more akin to a phase-in or a beta test, um, which you get to at the end, rather than uh, time-delineated trials uh, with suitable safeguards, uh, which uh, are really where we are now. We saw what happened when you tried to flip a wire center on Fire Island this summer, um, and I'm very glad to hear AT&T say, we don't want to do a flash cut like that. Uh, the issue here is, as the FCC properly said in its public notice, is that while the trial is voluntary for the carrier, it is not voluntary for the customers. 
And the other point I would make is that in a network, if something goes really wrong and the wire sender starts to go down, it can take down other portions of the network with it. So we believe in being cautious, but we think that as with any other kind of trial, there needs to be appropriate safeties in place uh, and uh, that those need to be described and settled before uh, we initiate any trials rather than after uh, we get into it. All right, thanks. I'm going to yield my time back, Mr. Chairman. The general lady yields back, and at this time, the chair to recognize the chairman emeritus of the full committee, Mr. Dingle, five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy, and I commend you for this hearing. I also wish to express my thanks to Mr. Welch for his courtesy to me. Thank you. I'd like to begin by welcoming a fellow citizen of Michigan, Mr. Mark Iannuzzi, this morning. His company, Telnet Worldwide, offers valuable services to the businesses of Michigan. At issue this morning is a transition to IP-based communications networks. As some of our witnesses have noticed, this transition is already underway and has the potential to confer significant economic and technological benefits on our people. But we need to learn more about what that transition means for the future of communications in this industry, and particularly as how it will affect the consumers. Incumbent carriers make the very valid point that they are required to maintain TDM networks at great cost, despite the fact that only 30% of all Americans used ILEC switched networks in 2012. It's my view that the billions spent to maintain legacy networks can be more efficiently based and invested in IP-based networks that will be the backbone of the 21st century telecommunications. This part will help uh, advance the goals of the 2010 National Broadband Plan. With that said, I understand that AT&T has petitioned the Federal Communications Commission for forbearance from certain regulations in order to establish two geographically limited IP-based test projects. I think there's real value in this approach. It will provide an invaluable case study to consumers, businesses, policymakers, and to the government about what the transition to IP-based networks will entail. I encourage the Commission to work with AT&T to set these projects in motion, making certain that there are mechanisms in place for monitoring and effectively resolving uh, consumer complaints. In addition to the lessons that we can learn from AT&T's potential trial projects, I suggest that policymakers also keep in mind several fundamental principles when considering the role of government vis-a-vis -vis IP based communications. As public knowledge has wisely suggested, our focus should be on ensuring universal connectivity, uh, interconnection and competition, consumer protection, network reliability and public safety. Those are very important principles to be kept in mind as we go forward. I firmly believe that there still exists a need for certain ex ante obligations because the Communications Act's purposes to make available insofar as possible to all, and I emphasize all people of the United States, the benefits of our communications system. That presumption and that comment is as valid, valid today as it was 79 years ago. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. I have, uh, I'm yielding back a minute and 24 seconds, and I thank Mr. Welch, and I thank, I'll be happy to yield the gentlelady. I appreciate it, uh, Mr. Dingell. Can I just uh, pursue this issue of the trial? It seems to me that there is kind of a chicken and egg thing going on. Um, between um, uh, the FCC, maybe it's because we don't have, you know, a full, a commission yet, but it, it seems to me th the following, and I could be wrong, so Jim, you just jump in and tell me if you think I'm wrong. You'll do that anyway, but anyway. Um, 
you want the trials, you want uh, the FCC to approve, give you the green light to go ahead with a trial. It seems to me that the FCC is saying, we'll do a trial, but we want the following things in it, and there's not an agreement. Does that look anything like how you see reality? Um, because time is going on, and, right, and right. Uh, I, I think I, what uh, uh, Mr. Dingle said is it's just on the mark. I, we need I, to get going. Honestly, think, I, I think it may just be a function of our timing uh, on this, uh, um, um, as, as one chairman is on his way out and another chairman isn't, isn't yet in there. Um, the, the, the questions I actually issued uh, um, um, uh, um, were, were fairly recent, I mean, and they, and they waited until six months after we filed the petition to actually uh, ask the questions. And, and, and frankly, I, I, I mean, like, uh, uh, like a lot of you, I've been around the town a while, and I, and, and I took the questions as a, as a way of the FCC saying we're not ready to answer this yet. Um, um, but I, I do take comfort in the fact that, that we have Democratic and Republican commissioners both on the, on the FCC who said, yes, we should have trials. Commissioner mm -hmm. Pye said that. Commissioner Rosenworcel has said that. Categorically go forward. The, the principal author of the National Broadband Plan, Blair Levin, has said absolutely. He would have, he would have said yes to the trials on day one. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the key, uh, the, the key Congresswoman is, you know, this isn't about us exclusively. It's industry-wide and it's nationwide. And, and I, I, for one, have been reluctant to put in the FCC a quote-unquote AT&T plan for conducting the trials. I think it's really the job of the FCC to work <laughs> with all of industry and all stakeholders and, frankly, state-level government as well to design those trials, much like was done during the DTP transition. And I'm pretty confident that once Chairman Wheeler gets there that that's what will happen. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dingell. The gentlelady lady yields back her time to the gentleman and whose time has expired. And uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great hearing. I've learned a lot. Um, and I love trying to stay as long as I can because you really do hear the point-counterpoint. But you never miss the opportunity to hear a member bring up a personal story. So. I'm, I'm, uh, Mr. Sircone, I'm sure your staff prepared you for that personal story of the, and if they didn't, then you might need to look I, for other I, staff I wish members. Mr. Shimkus. <laughs> but um, th let me address, um, and, and I always get concerned when I start agreeing with Mr. Waxman every now and then. Uh, I have to check the data file on that, but um, I, I do agree we need to move on a, on a, a test. We, need to, we just need to move forward. Um, and, and to uh, his comments on Google, uh, I would, and I'm, they're probably out here or they're listening, I, I would encourage them to come in because my guess it is 251, 252 is why they're not in a voice. That's what my guess is. Now, if you've talked to them, Mr. Feld, and, and they've given you that data, but I think there's interconnection issues. I, I, it's very in, informative that they're not doing that. And I think that's a lesson we should learn and, and find out. So um, having said that, just a blanket statement, and I know the FCC is looking into this, these drop calls in rural areas are an issue. And uh, that talks about a backstop. I mean, that also reinforces an issue of having some type of backstop. So I want to raise that. Um, but to Mr. Feld and Mr. Ciccone, um Public safety is a big issue for, for all of us here. Anna and I work very closely on this. Um, how, in this move, uh, how, how do you envision public safety being positively or maybe hopefully not negative? We're, we won't accept a negative, obviously, response on public safety. So how do we deal with that? Why don't we start with Mr. Ciccone, then we'll go to Mr. Feld. I, I, I mean, I, 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 I hate Mr. Shimkus to, 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 to sound like it's circular reasoning here, but I think this is one of the reasons we need to have the trials out there. We're fairly confident uh, that, that we can design these systems in a way that, that takes account of public safety. Moreover, we fully accept that they have to uh, work well for public safety. You simply can't have a, de a new technology deployed where 911 doesn't work or other public safety features don't work. So I, I think it's. I, I think we all recognize this is imperative, and I think we need to stress test it to ensure that, that it does work and that, and that we can transition it uh, 
uh, uh, accordingly. But, but I think we all accept the obligation has to be there, and we simply can't replace the old technology with new technology unless 911 works. Thank you, Mr. Feld. Uh, two things. One, planning precedes trials rather than trials preceding planning. Uh, and the thing that has been troubling to me is I get that we will need to have some information that we'll gather in the trials. That's the point of doing trials. But before we say, let's throw a switch and see what happens to public safety on this stuff, um, I want to know what the recovery mechanisms are. I want to have limited tests first before you move on to full tests. The other important factor is we need to start thinking of how we make a more robust public safety system in our competitive and differently enabled technology universe. There is virtue in redundancy. So maybe we don't have to put everything on every network the same way if we have ways in which the networks will work together uh, better for, uh, uh, for public safety. We've seen some things coming out of the Hurricane Sandy uh, hearings uh, that the FCC has been conducted, where we've seen how different technologies have different strengths and weaknesses and have responded uh, in a different way. Uh, and I think that one of the exciting advantages of the IP transition uh, is that it allows us to start thinking about how to take advantage of the structures of the Internet, which rely on redundancy and flexibility for stability, rather than requiring five nines reliability from every single network that's participating. The right. last thing I'll just mention is we do have to be wary of new issues that are coming up. I mentioned in my testimony the problem of swatting, which is caller ID spoofing, which allows people as a joke to send SWAT teams to other people's houses. That's not a particularly funny joke. Uh, and while obviously um, these are challenges that need to be resolved, we need to be accumulating this checklist of what needs to work as we move forward. Yeah, and let me finish on this. Um, I've been really involved with uh, trying to raise this silo issue of the FCC with the convergence of technology, and, I, and I've given up. I don't think we'll ever change the FCC and, and the bureaus that it has. The last thing, the question is, Mr. Anuzi, have you seen the, uh, uh, in the business sector the cutting of the cord uh, from landline to cell for the business community as we've seen in residential services? Uh, Mr. Congress, uh, excellent question. In the business community, it is a distinctly landline-oriented business. While mobile phones are part of the workforce for the uh, common employee, the way that businesses communicate and collaborate is inherently a landline type of function. It's because there's group fit capabilities going on. You're, you're continually interacting with a wide variety of locations, perhaps, and so forth, which is not conducive to how cellular technology has been deployed, which is more about the individual and how that connects to, together. And if I, if I may, uh, on your very important item here about uh, uh, security and public safety, the competitive energies already has migrated to, for the most part, to IP-based uh, 911 service. It's a far superior solution than, than the currently the legacy TDM one. Why? Because if on an IP-based, when we're trying to get our customers call to an emergency authority, the IP network allows us to make sure that if there's any bottleneck to get to the public safety point, we have alternate routes to alternate safety points to get to them or answer it even through our own operators to make sure that we connect the dots. Furthermore, we've added in cool technology where if, if somebody picks up the phone and they dial 911, we not only send the call to the public safety organization, but we can then send it to the building supervisor, the provost of the university, or if you were a residential user, you could go to, um, you're out on the show and, and somebody calls 911 from your home, we'll send it to your cell phone so that you know that a 911 call was made from your, from your phone. So we've already made that move. And, um, and this thing about the, the IP to IP interconnection, yeah, do you have to do things in a measured fashion? Certainly. Uh, but when it comes to networks interconnecting and peering at the IP basis, that's different than how you're talking to the end user. And that IP to IP interconnection goes on right now. Well, thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. And the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Burke, uh, thank you for being here. Your testimony mentions that few carriers in Vermont are investing in fiber. And I, my question, what policy decisions 
would change carrier incentives to invest in rural areas? And are there regulations that are imposing unnecessary costs that are hindering any of that investment? Oh, thank you for the question, Congressman. I think that that uh, uh, it's a very tricky um, uh, question when you get to uh, how do we move out into uh, a better business plan in, in more rural areas. I mean, dollars are dollars. And I guess to call on a predecessor of my own, and, and I'll go back to my grandfather. He was a dairy farmer, and uh, I can remember when I was little, uh, he said, uh, you know why this, this, chair, this stool has three legs, Johnny? And I said, uh, no, sir, I don't. He said, because if it had two, it would just fall over. <laughs> and I think that that's actually, I think that's actually what we may be dealing with here. I think we actually have a potential as we move forward into an IP world, and we're moving there. Uh, to be able to do it in a better and more focused way if, in fact, we use a, a stool with three legs. Uh, the federal leg that, that obviously is your responsibility and the FCC's um, industry's leg and how we get out there to make ubiquity part of the process here, because if it's not ubiquitous, it doesn't really work the way we want it to work. And last but not least is the state's responsibility and the state's ability, be it uh, with their own uh, USF um, uh, funds to help manage to get this stuff out there, uh, or be it um, uh, their policies to, to, uh, to help make the um, uh, move out for industry itself more seamless, uh, easier, and more attractive to their business plan. The states are a vital part of this. And without three legs to that stool, I'm not so sure that it's got any chance of succeeding. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and for Mr. Ciccone and Mr. Iannuzzi, just quickly, what actions are required by the FCC in order to ensure that competition will continue and actually thrive in an all IP world? And I'd appreciate it if it was quick and ABC, because I don't have that much time. We'll start with you, Mr. Ciccone. Well, I, I think you have competition today, Mr. Welch, and I, and I, think, uh, I, I think as the FCC moves forward with the IP transition, it certainly ought to take a look at what regulations are needed going forward to, to help preserve the competition that's there today. I, I'd certainly grant that, but, but I'd also suggest that, that on a going forward basis that, that, uh, uh, that it would be a mistake to assume that the problems of the, of the present and the future are necessarily the same as they were in 1996 or 1934. And, and so I, I, I think the notion of taking legacy mm -hmm. rules and applying them to new technology is something the National Broadband Plan actually spoke to. And it, and it talked about how applying legacy rules could actually retard uh, the, the, the investments that were necessary and could have unintended consequences of siphoning investments away from the new technologies uh, that were needed. And, and so uh, I think that would be our main concern is that, is that, is that we not, we not overcorrect here and assume there are problems until we actually know what those problems are. Thank you. Mr. Anuzzi. It is very simple. In terms of the FCC, we just need the clarity that it removes that there is any technological implication in the, the way the Act works. It is technically neutral. Communication systems are by their design technical. So if there is not technical advancements, then what, what were we trying to do in terms of trying to get where we are at if we weren't trying to make things better, faster, cheaper, smarter? So my point here is that the key thing to, to ensure competition is to eviscerate, take out the eraser on this thought that we have a technology underpinning to the act, because it was about creating competition. It was a framework to create a, a, a market-based structure so that we could compete. Okay. Thank you very much. And back to Mr. Burke. Uh, we have got a real epidemic of rural call completion, and as far as uh, my constituents and the people you uh, serve as well are concerned, fixing that problem can't come fast enough. Uh, how can IP transition help to address the issue of incomplete calls, particularly in rural areas? Well, I think that obviously you have to take a look um, uh, as you move forward here with where the problems lie. And, uh, uh, you know, if you take a look at uh, what we will see, I think, in call completion, the order comes out next Monday, I believe, is, uh, is the uh, date that the FCC is actually going to issue it. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that call completion is, is uh, probably a, a methodology that, that grew from um, uh, terminating access charges. And as uh, least cost routers sensed uh, uh, 
heavy um, uh, terminating access uh, charges, they decided that they would not complete the call. You know, lease cost routers are innovation, too, and we can't get carried away with innovation. Certainly, it's given us a lot of good things, but I suspect that, that the idle innovator, like the idle hands, can be the devil's work thing, too, when it wants to be, and, and in fact, uh, that may have been the case here. Uh, the, the, um, uh, how we go forward is to try to make sure that there is a regulatory touch as well that keeps an eye uh, on uh, moving forward in this transition. Mr. Ciccone hasn't, hasn't said that that isn't the right idea. I would point out, too, that with call completion, that began in the, and the answer to that began through the States. When the problems occurred, I know that you got them, um, uh, Congressman. You said that you did, and I believe that you did. But the fact of the matter is most of the time your Public Service Commission or your AG's office probably got them first as people became unhappy with what they were getting and what they weren't getting in rural America. Yeah. And hopefully um, uh, keeping uh, those regulations in place will allow for uh, consumers to get the kind of of um, uh, protection that they have learned to expect uh, in their old network as we move through to a new one. Okay. I, my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back, and the Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you having this hearing, and I want to thank all of the witnesses for coming and, and testifying and giving your perspective on the, uh, the changes in technology. Uh, I'm excited by it when you see the, uh, the things that people are able to do now as we, we have this transition to Internet protocol. Uh, you, know, you also have coupled with that uh, the, the upgrades that are being made from copper uh, to, uh, to fiber optics. And, uh, of course, that brings billions of dollars of investment. It gives consumers a lot more options to do things with voice and video and sending larger packets of data. Uh, of course, the investments that go with it, I know, uh, Mr. Ciccone, your company and, and other incumbents are investing billions of dollars uh, to help uh, build out these new networks, use this new technology in better ways, uh, even with the current regulatory environment. And, uh, I want to ask your take because some would say that, you know, the fact that you are investing these billions of dollars proves that uh, there is no need to change the regulatory structure. How, how would you answer that? Well, I think the, the first thing I would do is, is kind of refer back to the chart, Congressman, uh, that, that, that opened the hearing here that, that talks about the, the way the market is set up today, where we have, uh, by the end of this year, we will have three-quarters of, uh, uh, of Americans. Uh, um, uh, using either either wireless only or or VoIP providers as opposed to the circuit switched uh, uh, provider. As I said earlier, we have fewer than 14 million uh, circuit switched telephone customers uh, at AT and T at the present time, which is a uh, a, a small fraction uh, of of the of the numbers that any other provider has out there in these competitive markets. Um, so uh, I I think that'd be the first point I'd make. The the second point is that. Um, um, the investment that, that has occurred over the last few years in wireless and, and IP technologies is, of course, I, I think it's, it's related to the fact that these are the least regulated areas of technology. It's, it's not accurate that the 96 Act is technology neutral. In fact, it, it penalizes wireline technologies uniquely uh, uh, by imposing a lot of extra requirements on them. And I think that is one of the reasons that Google has decided not to offer voice service in a city like Kansas City. And, and I think and those regulations. Point. I want to yes, ask you about that because the 96 yes. Telecommunications Act does impose some, some ILEC specific yes. uh, rules. How does, that in, uh, how does that actually affect your investment decisions? Well, I, 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 I think on a going forward basis with IP, I think we hear what Google hears, which is, which is some companies advocating that we simply take the common carriage model in Title II and apply it as if nothing has changed to modern competitive IP services. And I, and, and I certainly think that is not what the Act envisioned. I also think it would be a big mistake. But it, but it creates regulatory overhang for a company like Google or a company like AT&T in deciding to make a wireline investment decision. Now, now to, 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 to the final point, we have gone ahead anyway here recently and decided to invest in this area. And, and, and quite honestly, it was a difficult decision for us, running fiber to these buildings and expanding our UVerse services to millions more Americans, including in a lot of rural areas. And, and, uh, but, I, but I think it is a leap of faith on AT&T's part in terms of the regulatory environment. We have read the National Broadband Plan. We take comfort in the fact that it speaks to these issues 
It has been endorsed by the President. It has been endorsed by the Congress on a bipartisan basis. And I think it gives us confidence going forward that these regulatory issues and uncertainties will get settled in the proper manner. And, of course, I think one of the reasons we filed for the trials is to kind of spur that along. All right. Well, I appreciate that. I want to ask Mr. May, because I am running out of time. Uh, you have been advocating for, uh, for an updated Telecommunications Act to reflect the digital age. Uh, if you can share with me some of the principles that you would envision, uh, and, and I, I left my brick uh, telephone at home because I didn't want to get into that here, but since I've got you here, you know, you might even want to mention something about the 92 Cable Act, which is probably also very out, up, outdated and needs to be updated. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. That's outdated for uh, sure, the 92 Act, and, and frankly, the 96 Act uh, is as well, although at the time it was adopted, it, it you know, uh, wasn't transitional. Uh, piece of legislation that was good. You know, here, here are the basic fundamental principles going forward, and, and you just have, have to think about it really in the larger sense, because there are obviously, I have talked about some regulatory backstops and safeguarding universal service and so forth, but, but in a large sense, a new act should get rid of the silos that are in the present act, the stovepipes, and they are not technology neutral, they are based on technology constructs, uh, the different titles. Uh, it, and it should replace the public interest standard that now is in the Act in 110 different places that delegates authority to the FCC just to act in the public interest, that indeterminate standard, with a competition-based standard uh, that is antitrust-like. Not, I'm not suggesting it's you're going to import all of antitrust jurisprudence, but it's going to focus on the competitive marketplace, and regulation therefore shouldn't be adopted unless there's a market failure or uh, proof of, of uh, consumer harm. And then finally, what the, a new act should do is circumscribe uh, somewhat the FCC's general rulemaking authority, which now, as you know, operates in what we would call an ex ante anticipatory fashion. When, when you engage in that process, what you do by definition is, is conjecture harms that may occur in the future because you are trying to conceive of all potential harms. What happens is, generally, those types of rulemakings are overly broad, broader than they need to be. So you want to you want to get the FCC to act more in a post hoc capacity, acting on individual complaints that say there is a specific problem. You know, Mr. Anuzi says, uh, with this carrier in this place, there is a market failure for some reason. Uh, I have got an interconnection problem. You take it into an adjudicatory context and you try and address that specific problem rather than proscribing a lot of conduct that otherwise might be beneficial uh, to the country uh, otherwise. I appreciate the answers, and uh, Mr. Chairman, yield back to the Mr. Uh, thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired, and the Chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, want, I think we can all agree that the IP transition already underway is good for American consumers, the economy, and the country as a whole, so I, I welcome this uh, conversation. However, we must work with industry, public interest groups, and consumers to ensure that as it progresses, these technological advances do not come at the expense of consumer choice and access, public safety, or competition. I, I think some of you know that nearly a year ago, October 29th is next week, my district and the state of New Jersey were hit hard by uh, Hurricane Sandy. And one of the many impacts of that devastation was the loss of communication services. Power outages and floods disrupted many types of communications, including wireless television, telephone, and internet services. In fact, yesterday we were, I was with uh, Congressman uh, Leonard Lance and uh, Yvette Clark and uh, Congressman Holt and Congressman Payne in Newark, and we were talking about this, uh, you know, on a bipartisan, regional basis. Um, so I wanted to ask, I know, I know some of this uh, has been touched upon. I'm, I'm going to try not to be repetitive. But I understand that traditional copper networks operate even when power lines go down. So my question of Mr. Sacconi is because AT&T has a large legacy copper communications network and significant plans to deploy new fiber infrastructure, how will the, the new fiber networks handle natural disasters like hurricanes? 
we know what happened, you know, we know that the, the copper continued to operate, but what happens now with, um, with the new fiber networks and, you know, dealing with that issue? How are you going to deal with it? I, I'm, there, there's unfortunately no IP technology, Congressman, that, that allows you to power the line. You, you know, you, you, you cannot put power over, over a fiber connection. Uh, right. Fiber has many other advantages in addition, though, to, to its Internet capacity, and, and one of them I think is relevant in a hurricane or, or a flooding zone or in a sandy type situation is that, is that seawater will destroy copper uh, and, make it, and make it unrepairable. Um, fiber is very resilient in, in that type of situation, and frankly, so are our wireless networks. They are very resilient. We, we get them up, uh, back up and running very quickly uh, after these storms, and I say that knock on wood because we are still in hurricane season. Now, I, I, again, I think that we all agree that these communities should not lose services they rely on simply because they are unlucky enough to be in the path of the storm. So if there are, um, you know, different consequences from these replacement services with fiber. Um, you know, why, uh, again, I guess this goes back to the trials, but is, what else can we do? Is there anything else we can do? And what, what are you going to do with these real world, tri real world trials so we can, how do they relate to the problem that, uh, that I just discussed? Um, well, sir, I, I mean, it was, it, it, I don't want to second guess, you know, a decision made by other carriers, but I, but I think that what trials and, and proper planning uh, for the IP transition would allow is for us to test the, the capabilities of these services and not have people surprised if you deploy a service and a fax machine doesn't work the same way, things of that nature. I do think it is iterative, though. I think the technology will evolve and, 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 frankly, we can help it evolve if we know what we are trying to, to do. For example, in, in our wireless home phone service, we have actually asked the manufacturers to add a data capability. That came online this summer, so we actually have that in our wireless home phone product. But, but I think as we go forward over the years, I would expect that, 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 that the wireless capabilities will evolve and change. Uh, uh, to meet those needs uh, uh, so that, frankly, it, it could be more robust and, and more reliable uh, and, and provide all of the same services and more that our copper line facilities do. Did Mr. Did you have your hand up? Go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. One of the things that we have uh, asked the FCC to do uh, and to put a priority on this um, is to initiate a separate proceeding for uh, disaster uh, guidance. We had, as you know, situation in Manilocking, New Jersey, also Fire Island, where Verizon did not know what they were supposed to do. They didn't want to rebuild their copper network, but they uh, uh, also needed, had no guidance for what they should be doing uh, instead. Um, we think that uh, uh, the FCC, in order to address this problem of public safety, needs to get out there uh, and start a proceeding right now, first thing, of as we are doing this transition. And we know that carriers are going to want to put in new infrastructure. Uh, as they yeah, rebuild after storms like Sandy, um, what are their responsibilities? What are they supposed to do and what can the people in those communities rely on uh, in order to uh, uh, be able to rebuild their lives? We have asked that. We have had 17 other public interest organizations join us uh, in asking the FCC to begin a proceeding on this, and hopefully uh, we will uh, see action on that uh, as soon as uh, uh, Chairman Wheeler uh, is confirmed. Go ahead. With the chairman's uh, approval, go ahead. You may comment. Yeah, I'd like to point out uh, one key thing here is that uh, is to make sure we, we embrace the small, middle-sized business market. A lot of conversation here focuses on residential, and that's certainly important. Uh, the charts that I see on the side here talk about a, a degradation and, uh, and copper-based usage at the residential level. That is not the case at the business level. The business, that is typically the only connection into there is a copper facility. That copper facility can handle uh, the power line backup requirement you need. So we often deploy where they are working in parallel. We have, we have the, the next generation IP technology taking care of all those ones, and then we have the copper-based lit services, which are taking care of all those other critical functions and allowing that to work its place out as, uh, as time goes on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. And the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Long, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. And given your testimony, I'm kind of the cleanup hitter here, so uh, 
Well, they should have started with me. We'd have been done a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Mr. Ciccone, you made mention earlier in the questioning portion of this hearing that you have read the FCC's national broadband plan. And being that you have read that, I will remind you that they uh, came to a conclusion, the FCC's national broadband plan, to quote, regulations require certain carriers to maintain plain old telephone service, and they highlight a requirement that is not sustainable and lead to investments in assets that could be stranded. So if the FCC believes that, their main that maintaining legacy telephone service is not sustainable, and that investments are at risk of being stranded, shouldn't the FCC change its policies that have caused this problem? Well, Ms. Uh, uh, I, I, I do think it's appropriate for the FCC to move forward, to put together an excellent plan at your direction, at the Congress's direction. Uh, it's been widely endorsed. It anticipated the, this very issue in the words you quoted. Um, and, and, uh, um, you know, and unfortunately we're four years along here and I, and I don't think we've seen the implementation of some of the things that they recommended. And, and, uh, but, I, but I remain very hopeful that, that once, the, once the, the Commission is back up to full strength uh, that they'll do so. Uh, and again, our, our, our petition last year for the, for the IP trials was designed in part to spur along the very process you just highlighted, sir. Okay. Uh, again, when you're the last guy at bat, uh, some of this you've touched on before, but let me ask you to elaborate, if you will, on the types of services that would be available through these Internet protocols that are unavailable on the copper networks. Well, I think, I, I think the, the IP transition, and I'm, I'm, I'm at risk of oversimplifying, uh, I'm, a, I'm a liberal arts major, not an engineer, but uh, um, it, it, it by and large is about, it is about voice becoming simply another application riding on an Internet pipeline. Okay, so, so as, we, as we build out fiber, we're building out Internet capability, and voice then becomes just another application. And so uh, I, I think w what that provides, obviously, is competitive opportunities for a lot of people, but it, but it also provides much more accessibility. It allows people to design and, and innovate based on IP, and so you, you may bring to voice services through this IP transition some of the same innovations you're seeing you know, in every other form of Internet service. And, uh, you know, if you pull out an iPhone and you go through the App Store, I think you can, you can get a sense of the innovation that's available. And I think, I, I think as, we, as we transition these networks toward IP, I think we'll say, see the same types of innovation there. And I think it's, it's obviously important for the country from, from every standpoint of, of, of economic activity, but also, I think, uh, from a consumer standpoint, too. Okay. okay. I... Uh I have, uh, I represent Missouri 7, which is Springfield, Joplin, Branson area down southwest corner of the state. And I think that uh, we can all agree out of the 435 congressional districts that I have the best one in the United States. <laughs> and th in that area, there are 11 counties, part of 11 counties, 10 full counties, part of an 11th county. So I have a lot of rural areas along with Springfield, Joplin, Branson, and uh, a lot of my constituents don't have ready access to the latest medical technology and uh, even the number of doctors that you'd find in urban areas and that's another topic but uh, can you elaborate on the types of uh, telemedicine and mobile health applications that would be available to my constituents in the best congressional district in the United States if uh, they did have the IP services? <coughs> Well, sir, I think, uh, again, I think we, if we're able to get the, uh, the, the, the broadband connections into those areas, uh, and they're fulsome and they're both wired and wireless, I think, I, I think you have an in infinite variety of services that are available that are being, that are being uh, actually put together by innovators today. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, our entire health care system, uh, notwithstanding the, 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 the current difficulties, is actually innovating quite well. In, uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of making records available and things of this nature, um, and, and can you I, give me any more any specifics I, or anything I, I, on I, we, we telemedicine? We can mobile certainly pull health. something together for you, Mr. Long, and get it to you. Uh, I, I don't have anything specific I could lay out in the hearing here today. Though. Okay, I have zero seconds. So with that, <laughs> if I had any time, I'd yield it back. Okay, <laughs> comment. 
The uh, gentleman yields back, and his time has expired. Seeing no other members uh, wishing to uh, ask questions this afternoon, I want to thank you uh, for this uh, excellent panel, and I am sure that uh, the chairman would also uh, want me to extend his uh, heartfelt thanks for you all being here today. And without anything else coming before the committee today, we will stand adjourned. You did a great job. You did. You really did. Thank you. Yeah. Harold.